Welcome to Part the System, and today's episode is with Robin Smith. How are you going, Robin? Yeah, well, David, and you? Yeah, really good, thank you. Really good, and uh, yeah, really chuffed to, to be able to speak with you today. Um, but before we start, I'm just going to share a little bit of your bio. It's quite long, um, but I think it's really important that I, that, I, that I do you justice with this, so please just sit tight. Um, so yes, today um, I'm with Robin Smith. Now Robin's worked in the national at national level in sport and administration for the past 31 years and is currently the CEO of Sport Inclusion Australia. Previous roles include working closely with government agencies, Paralympics Australia, the national sporting organisations to develop appropriate inclusive services and opportunities for athletes with an impairment into the mainstream community. Now, Robin has had extensive experience with management and organisations of Australia teams in Spain, Sweden, Italy, Ecuador, South Africa, England and Australia. Now, England was your favourite there, Robin, wasn't it? Robin was also the CEO of the Global Games Sports Company, which is the local community organising committee, which delivered the 2019 Virtuous Global Games in Brisbane in 2019 which saw a staggering 1,000 athletes from 47 countries take part in celebrating inclusive sport excellence. That must have been a logistical challenge for sure. And uh, in Rio de Janeiro in 2013, Robin was elected as vice president of the Virtus, the International Federation for Athletes with Intellectual Impairment and was re-elected in Brisbane in 2019. Now, Virtus is a founding member of the International Paralympic Committee. And in 2020, Robin was elected as the inaugural chair of the ASAPD Australian Sporting Alliance for People with Disability. The group comprises of nine national organisations, sporting organisations representing people with disability and NSODs, which is very exciting. And um, Robin is a widow with three children and shares her life living in Brisbane and Benella and is also heavily involved in netball. I don't know where you find the time and has been coaching at all levels since 1982 when she finished her physical education degree. So I'm really, really excited to welcome Robin. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. That was uh, that's fantastic to, to learn a little bit more about you and um, yeah, we'll hopefully learn a little bit more. So we'll get straight into it. Robin, what does well-being mean to you? Uh, I think well-being is probably having a, a strong self-worth, uh, feeling good about yourself. Yeah, yeah, cool. And with that, like what are some of the things that you do to, to look after your well-being? Yeah, I think that this is really important. So to have a busy schedule like I do, it's really important that you look after yourself. So mm. I like to exercise. I'm probably fairly manic being a physical education teacher by training. Um, fitness and, and uh, is really important to me. So I exercise every morning and uh, try to get really good sleep and try and eat okay. So not always great at all three things, but um, I think that really does help with with um, the start of your your well-being and then pro I used to work almost all weekend to get everything done and to ease the load during the week but I've realized that I just need to take time off on the weekend so I make sure that I don't do much on the weekends now I try not to pick up my phone and just try to really down tools to come start fresh on Monday and it, and it works it's really great to be able to have that time smell the smell the roses and and uh, and then come back to work on a Monday morning yeah, yeah. I think managing those energy levels, isn't it, so important, especially if you're, if you're busy like you are. Uh, well, it's also difficult with the time zones because I am sitting on the International Committee in Australia so far away. You have to sometimes work at different stages of the night. The virtual meetings have been at 11 p.m. in the evening. So you just have to make sure that you take that time to, you know, be at your best. Yeah, and have, have some of those meetings run on a little bit longer then? What's some of the latest you've, you've stayed up? Um, I was up a couple of weeks ago till 2.30 a.m. So um, yeah, there were some discussions. Uh, the meetings have to be translated. Oh. So even though it might be a normal thought meeting, by the time the meetings get translated and, the, and um, where English is not the first language, by the time the delegates are able to have their say, which is important, mm. um, some meeting is a bit longer than expected or scheduled. Yeah, I'm not much good at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> no, <laughs> I try. I 
I don't blame you. I, I don't think I'd be too good on the morning as well after getting up if I stayed up till 2.30. Not these days, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I like the fact that you said you try and down your tools and, and get a bit of disconnection at the weekend, you know, just to um, refuel and get yourself ready for the for the for the week. I think that's that's important. Uh, I think I could help could do with some of that. But yeah, yeah tell it's, it. it's yeah, important on. because um, we, you know, just always wanted to sort of renovate and do stuff. So we've just been renovating and so learning to paint and learning to do bits and pieces and you see immediate results it's very good for the soul to see mm. i know i can see why artists keep painting and it's and, and or or people write stories because you're going to you've got an outcome and mm. something you can be really proud of and that that mm. does that's good for your well-being seeing something that you're able to produce with your hands yeah definitely the purpose for sure isn't it and that's why for tradies and things you know it's, um, it's always a great profession um and tell us a little bit about your your background then obviously I've, I've talked briefly about it but yeah your story Robin yeah um I started obviously doing uh physical education but I was pretty keen to do um physiotherapy actually uh, and I made a, a pledge with a girlfriend that we'd we'd um, we'd go really hard in our first year of our studies, and we'd switch into physio. But I loved physical education so much, the physiology, the biomechanics. Uh, I loved physics at school, so it was just understanding the human body and how it moves. Uh, and of course, got straight into coaching netball, which was my passion. So um, it just resonated with me. Then I liked. Uh, and I and I still believe today that being able to do something physically um, and be connected to community is really powerful for every human being. So mm. um, physical education was just something great. And then not long after that, I got into sports administration, um, found the job, first of all, at state level, um, which was pretty well what I'm doing at national level, at state level back in 1989. And I just love it. Every day I get up, I love it. It's it's just making sure that it's it's focused on a person first and using the power of sport and recreation and, and physical activity to move people into the community into the community in a meaningful way. Um, talk often about um, you can be uh, drive you can drive up to the tennis club in your bright shiny, shiny Mercedes, but if you can't play tennis, that's sort of where you fit in Australian culture, which I love. So it's a great leveler and um, yeah, it's just and so got involved in that and I probably have kept you asked me about the netball but I've kept the netball on the side because it's just my um touching uh, teaching the whole time you know I'm teaching young people the craft uh, and it's given me such joy so I've sort of kept the teaching and the physical education side of it going mm. while I've been working in this this selling sport so you know how lucky am I? I've worked in the sport industry my whole life uh and uh I love it so yeah. working both representing people who I believe need um, strong advocacy and representation, uh, working in an industry which I love, and working with like-minded people that that also believe sport um, is and physical activity is is important in everyone's life, and everyone should be able to partake. And even if it's not a club as such, being able to understand that they can go for a walk or a run or do a session, a, a, some sort of fitness session, will make them feel better. So. Mm. Uh, that's that's my and then obviously as as you mentioned I lost my husband in 2010 to motor neuron disease so done a lot of work with uh, fundraising um, in the local community and and in Melbourne to sort of raise the awareness of uh, motor neuron disease and it, it's sort of a boutique disease if you like mm. um, it's it's not it wasn't really well known and so it's it's trying to raise that awareness level so that we can get the funding we need to, to try and find something to treat it or cure. Because when my husband was diagnosed, uh, Michael, there was just, there was nothing. So they just shake your hand and you walk out in the street and it's quite, um, it's quite daunting, really. It's a moment in life I'll never forget. So doing what I can to try and uh, help others and raise, raise awareness, raise dollars. And my children are heavily involved as well. Uh, and it's something positive you do when you lose someone that's key if you can channel your energies into something that you can make a difference, then you realise that one, his name lives on in that work you're doing, but two, um, you're actually making a meaningful contribution. So, And we, we were um, supported incredibly. We moved to a country town um, in the mid-90s and we didn't think it was forever. We were just 
coming here for our children's education, nice community. Um, but when he got sick, we sort of battened down the hatches and decided that this is where we'd have to stay. And I cannot tell you how much support we got in the community um, from people, people bringing food and flowers and this constant support and picking the children up and taking them to sport or school or it was just incredible. So, and that, that, that lesson in life just made me keen to sort of, um, you know, make sure I give back to this community that's, mm-hmm. that's enough so much. So I think that's all. And I, I am passionate about what I do. Um, and uh, as I said before, I'm just lucky to wake up every day doing something that I love. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that story, Robin. And, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, when things like that happen in your life, it, you, yeah you can really appreciate the humanity in people. Like you said, you know, the community all rallying around and supporting you and it's, you know, it can bring out the best in us as well as, as, as how challenging it is. And I'm sure Michael's unbelievably proud of you and your family and you raised all this money, you know, which is this awareness, which is, which is amazing. Yeah. And uh, in terms of your, your career, like I love the fact you're at, you know the strategic policy level and and you know you're kind of nudging the system there you know for the betterment of communities but you're also you're on the ground delivering netball you know in in, the, in your local community as well so it's it's great that you kind of you you come at it from those both both those yeah. kind of actors well, i think the the other thing is that the person first approach applies mm. to not only people with a disability or any sort of marginalized group but it's probably applied to women so when I started as a CEO in this role there wasn't many mm. so it, it's it's um it's really important to give that information back to young women so that, yeah. that's another reason why netball coaching is really important to me because it's also teaching young country girls that they can be whatever they want to be yeah um and commitment and dedication and humility and all of the things that it's not all about them, but it is about what contribution they make and they get more out of it. And so that's another part of promotion of women that I feel really strongly about. Um, and I'm able to do it through something I netball who, which, you know, I love it. I just love it. It's the best sport in the world. <laughs> I've actually, I've actually got my uh, level one netball. I got that in England years ago. So, um, oh, well. there, there you go. So if you yeah. ever need any coaches, hit me up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I guess in, in terms of the um, working for people uh, initially, building the capacity of the of the system we have rather than developing a whole separate system mm-hmm. um, resonated with me and that that everybody should be able to be able to be involved in a community in sport at some level and to try and build the community. I understand there are times when, when someone has to participate in a like group. I get that. Um, there's a reason for it, but mm-hmm. we still need to build... The, the the main the mainstream system to be capable of understanding, uh, educated, they can communicate. They've got the tools required to be able to be inclusive. And whilst it it might not always be the way it goes, and and I'm certainly learning that as I go along, um, I'm still going to keep going and build the community so that people understand what it is. And and people with an intellectual disability um, haven't always had the chances that you and I have had. I'm sure we start. At, at primary school we try something we realize we're good at it and and we pursue it or we try a range of things and we're connected with friends and and we pursue it well it, when i started back in the late 80s and early 90s there wasn't a lot of choices um people felt that people with an intellectual disability needed to be with people with an intellectual disability over there out of the way and uh it's not the case and you know people have struggled at school sometimes been ostracized and bullied so once sport breaks down those barriers, it just allows um, uh, it, the the athlete or the person to be part of that community and be be feel welcomed and and uh, really have a chance and succeed and and excel in some cases. So uh, where the focus is on the sport. So many sport people, uh, if you if you've done netball, like you said, and I know you've done your your um, Ironman events, that once you focus on something and you see another human being focusing on that and doing well, prevailing, you have, there's some sort of synergy and you have respect mm. and you value them. And so all of a sudden it doesn't matter whether you've got a disability or you're from another country or, or male or female or what religion you are, you're doing a sport that you both love and 
And what I've found in my experience is that the mainstream coaches, they see um, an athlete with a disability participating and all of a sudden they'll say, oh, you know, they've got no left-hand layout there. I can fix that and I can fix this and I fix that. So rather than when I started, it was a lot of carers and parents or coaches. The minute the mainstream coaches started to see it, the level started to go up because they see it, they see the sport, not not anything else. And, and a good coach always usually gets around um, any uh, deficiencies to build those deficiencies to make that person um, capable. So that's why I'm very passionate because I believe sport can play a huge role in in helping people with it, with a disability assimilate. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you said, that people first and whether the coaches or mentors, it's just making them adjustments to to, to allow them to, to excel. So, I mean, you, you're at the perfect organisation for this then, aren't you, in Sports Inclusion Australia? So so tell, tell us a little bit about yeah, the organisation and, and how that fits into the system. So um, the, the founder of our organisation, Mari Little, travelled to, um, to Sweden and to listen to a philosopher talk about normalisation. Nothing <laughs> to do with sport. And she came home to Australia and she was a social worker and she decided to establish um, Ausrapid. So, which is this, what Sport yeah, Inclusion Australia previously. was called. Uh, and she believed that the normalisation was sort of the early to mid-80s where um, moving someone from an from institution into the community would solve all the problems and raise the bar. So um, that's true. And I know in the, in the 80s, the federal government started to, the Hawke government, I know, started to move people out of institutions into the community. But... You can't just plonk someone in the community and expect that, that the community will come to them and help them join it. So you, you actually took people out of institutions where they had day programs and activities and, and connections into a community, right right rationale, but mm. there were some bits and pieces missing. So he believed that sport and recreation was the perfect conduit to um, build the community and then link the people into that into those those communities. And... Um, I know she sat on the, she was the first female president of the Australian Paralympic Committee um, and she sat around the table of the, uh, which is now Paralympics Australia and fought for sport to own sport. And uh, there were others around the table that weren't as keen on that. They were keener to keep their own peace and yeah. they didn't believe that the the national sporting organisations could cope with the nuances of disability. So, and Murray just kept fighting the, the hard the, the hard fight to say the that, that let's, let's let's build yeah let's build the community it was really funny because when when I came along they'd go oh you're you you know you're friendly and you're not you're not um argumentative and I just said well I've had a like you said a trailblazer's done the hard yards and I've been able to come in and it was much easier for me but I still will stand up where required I've learned to to speak up but mm. start with it was it was the Sort of cut down the jungle, and I was able to go in and um, and and help, uh, help give people ideas, sport ideas that they can be involved. So, Sport Inclusion Australia, I mean, you know, I was really pleased that Paralympics Australia went down that path um, just before 2000, um, and sports started to own sport. Um, and you know, our our Paralympic team just sort of in Sydney, we won the games, um, and the athletics team looked after the athletics and the swimming team looked after the swimming and instead of being in little silos within the Paralympics it was a swim team and it was mm-hmm. the athletics team and if there was a jump coach they're looking after the jumpers you know not yeah. that is and so it just made sense and like I said before you've got really top level coaches I know Chris Nunn was heavily involved um and Chris was uh you know Australian representative himself and probably one of the best coaches and he just treated it as the athletics was the main thing and then what was it that, that they needed to do to tweak and it might stand for an uncoordinated child. What do you need to do with that uncoordinated child to teach them to catch and throw? Nothing to do with disability, just how do you help them um, overcome whatever it is. And he, he was uh, he was instrumental, certainly in the athletics team in, in 2000. So it's just slowly grown. Um, NSOs have picked up um, opportunities along the way and whilst yes, there's there's a need to, um, in some cases, have an event for people with a disability per se. There's also an opportunity to just keep that that um, that philosophy going with the mainstream world to keep building their capacity. So every 
coach that does a coaching course or every university student decides they want to work in a particular area, they know that there's a person first and these are where they can get the tools to just say, oh, no, no, come on, David, what do you want to do? I've got some ideas of what to do or, or they know where to go to seek help and so a child can try something and go to a local club and there'll be clubs. My, my utopia is there'll be clubs down the track that will know how to cope or where to go. Yeah, and it, it's building that capability, isn't it, within within clubs or organisations to integrate people with disability into into mainstream, you know. But that's not everybody's philosophy. I mean, I think we've come a long way, like you said, from from you know, the, you talk about some of the examples, you know, from the eighties and the nineties and things. Um, hopefully, that's you know where where we're heading. But do you do you think that? I mean. In terms of the next five to ten years, where do you think we'll get to? Look, I think I think the Paralympics that we've just finished um, in Tokyo were would, is just taking it to another step. Um, people have stopped seeing uh, the disability and started to seeing excellence and people overcoming adversity. I mean, I was telling Katie Kelly, who represented Australia in the para triathlon, talking to her this morning, and she was a bit bit disappointed with her results, and I just said. My God, you know, you won gold in Rio. I watched that race. I watched how hard and you, you were totally spent at the end. How can anyone be disappointed with that? And when you know that every year her eyesight's getting worse and she's already deaf and hard of hearing, her Usher syndrome is making it worse. And she's 46 years old and she's done a triathlon at the Paralympic level and she's, you know, you can't else. I just said, you're my hero this morning. And, and the other event was the the woman that finished the triathlon after losing her leg six months ago, having her leg amputated and she's finished the five Ks on crutches. Um, I, I just, it makes you think to yourself, what have I got to complain about? Here's this, this woman that has decided to run, you know, swim, ride and run in a Paralympic triathlon after losing her leg six months ago. So her prosthetics, not even, her body's not even balanced yet to use that prosthetic. So she needs crutches. Imagine running with crutches for 5K. And so he just, and she smiled the whole last bit, you know, and I just think the Paralympics is just, it's almost if we could bottle the essence of it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a drug we all should inject into us because it's just this celebration of life, celebration of ability, celebration of, you know, prevailing over adversity. They're, they're always humble mm-hmm. in their speeches. They're very appreciative. And then the government stepped up and said, well, your medal's worth the same. And I think I think people are just appreciating. And I think the, the um, I was told last week that the ratings for Channel 7 were terrific. Mm. So fingers crossed that, that, um, that it not only that the platform has developed, but any child, and it doesn't have to mean they'll get all the way to the Paralympics, but any child's inspired and goes, oh, I can see myself on the other side. I can see people prevailing. I've got that. And it's, you know, one of the things that I loved was people are proud of their disability. Mm. Whereas in probably back in five, ten years ago, they'd be hiding it if they could. Yeah. Whereas yeah. now they're proud of it. And yeah. cel- it is what it is. Yeah. And we're able to in- celebrate it with them and say, oh, my God, how you being able to do that with one arm? Or, you know, just appreciate the performance. And I think that's what sport sport does for us so I think the next five to ten years um, I'm hoping uh, forever optimistic that we really go another step and, and understand that sport and because the other thing with sport is the people we're talking about here you know they're talking about 15 16 percent of our population they're paying they're paying um, people like they've mm. got funds they become consumers they become fans they become attached to the community and and why not so, you know, I'd like to know why not. Mm. And no one can give me a reason why not. So I think that the next five to 10 years, I'm fingers crossed that we'll, we'll continue to evolve and, and uh, you know, we've got, we've, humanity's got a little, little ways to go yet, but mm. I still get disappointed when people put people into pigeonholes, whether it's a group of um, people from a particular country or a group mm. of people, still get upset with that. There's no need for it. Mm. Um, we don't need to be identifying people by where they come from mm-hmm. or their gender or, you know, it's not necessary. So I'm hoping that we get to that point with, with um, people with a disability. So they're very proud to go out and have a go at things and they're being welcome to have a go at things and they join a local club and 
they they're part of that club for whatever it offers. Yeah, here, here, and I think I think we've smashed that stigma, haven't we, around around disability, and hopefully. You know, I'm really confident that we can make the the Brisbane Olympics the most inclusive yet, uh, which is obviously exciting for us Australians um, in the next decade. And I, I agree, but like some of those stories, and there's there's hundreds of them. I could pick any, you know, like like you, but you know, one of them that was for me was um, the person that lost both of her legs because her parents were a suicide bomber. And did you hear that one? And she blew, she she lost her legs as a child, and then she's come back, and you know, it's just. Like coming over that adversity, I think it just puts things in perspective, doesn't it? It's uh, it's absolutely remarkable. So it's been it's been amazing, um, like you said, and yeah, hopefully um, it's changed a few people's perceptions. And uh, yeah, I think if anybody can see themselves like them on television, it can inspire, can it? You know, so hopefully it's inspired. You know, I think of- that's what our um, the first female prime minister said that if um if there's a young girl that sees that it's possible yeah. then her job's been successful so yeah. I'm, I'm like that it's not about political statements it's just about if every little girl goes anything's possible mm. then that's the that's a big tick isn't it it is do you think we'd ever merge the paralympics and um, olympics or do you think it'll just be too much of a logistical nightmare <laughs> I, I think the commonwealth games has been incredibly successful um, but, and I think maybe the Commonwealth Games, this is just my opinion, but the Commonwealth yeah. Games where the events have been integrated and the medals have been equal value, I think that's done a lot, certainly in Australia, to value the athletes. And then mm. we've had some really good personalities that have stepped up. Um, and I'm thinking that it's probably the Paralympics wouldn't want to do that. So, mm. um, but yeah. It's it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. Sorry, someone's mowing outside. Can you believe it? Can you hear that? No, no, it's really okay. all, all good. As Sounds long okay. as it, okay. as long as you're all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Yes, yeah, so I think I think that um, the Paralympics alone, it, I think to combine the two would be incredible. There are events included in the Olympics, and there has been mm. since 2000. And those events, uh, I know Louise Savage won a gold in in 2000. Yeah. Um, and but yeah, I think uh, it's maybe maybe they're the curtain raiser. Maybe the Paralympics go first. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know that they'll ever be. There's there's a fair feeling within the International Paralympic Committee to to celebrate the Paralympics. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I like the fact it's got its own recognition. You know, I think that's that's really cool. And um, you're involved in this, the inaugural, I think, Virtus or Oceania Asian Games, which will be held next year. And we talked about humanity, but that's got a vision of sport for humanity and celebration, sport and cultural diversity. So you, you've been a part of these these events now for quite a while, um, Robin. But yeah, tell it, tell us about the games and, and what's what's to look forward to. So we. You mentioned in the in the um, starting preface that um, we had the Global Games in Brisbane in 2019, and we did have a thousand athletes from 47 countries. Um, but there were many countries within the region that just weren't weren't included. Um, mm-hmm. And so the Paralympics that have just gone on, I think there was 179 countries, and only um, 79 of those countries have athletes with an intellectual disability. So that means 100 countries are doing nothing for intellectual disability in this this area. So um, I have chatted to Andrew Parsons, the president of the International Paralympic Committee, about this inequity. Mm. Um, and being able to do something in our region, which is clearly Oceania, Asia is the biggest region together in the world, with India and China involved. Um, if we can help those countries, I mean, China uh, didn't have an athlete with an intellectual disability They did come to the Global Games for the first time ever, and we have been working with them. They're very keen. Can I just just ask why that is, Robin? Because, like, you think about population levels, right? Like, that that is incredible if they have, I I can't believe that. Well, they've got two million athletes with an intellectual disability on their books, two million. So they're, they're running, it takes 10 days to do their nationals for intellectual disability. So they've got them, but they didn't know how to do the eligibility. So... Virtus and hopefully Sport Inclusion Australia can assist some of those countries with the information they need. And 
there'll probably be people that'll hit me over the head. If China starts to e- enter the area, they're probably going to steal more medals. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it is about humanity. It's not about medals. Um, mm. It's definitely about making sure that people have opportunity. So there are many um, islands around in the Oceania that haven't been able to access. Um, and we believe that the Oceania Virtus Games can be a, a stepping stone to providing information, uh, celebrating excellence. The global games that we did in 2019 was basically run. The, uh, the NSO, the National Sporting Organization, signed off letters of, for the bid. Um, the state sporting organizations in Queensland conducted the games. We trained officials and, and um, volunteers and everyone involved on what it is to work with someone with a cognitive disability. Um, and that helped. That, that really helped. And then they look at the performance and they go, oh, my goodness, they're amazing. Uh, and so there were spin-offs just from that event. So we're hoping that by having a game where we can bring the Oceania countries to, uh, not quite at the level of the global games, but we can also get the IPC involved and we can get, we can understand that, that um, it is about the mission of Paralympic Games is not always about the, 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 um, mm. the gold medals at the top end. It's very much about uh, cultural diversity. And as Andrew said, leave no one behind. So mm. we feel in our area, the intellectual disability area, that, that it's not always at the fore because we haven't got these eloquent athletes that can speak so beautifully on advertisements about their plight and what they've overcome um, and some of the athletes don't know what they've overcome. They just know that they've, yeah. you know, things don't work exactly how they should. So mm. we want to advocate for them by having an event and celebrating. And there's an opportunity to celebrate with other disability groups there as well. Yeah. And just share if if Department of Foreign Affairs or Trade are working with um, Oceania Islands, what can we do to enhance the, the intellectual property or whatever they need to make sure that everyone's got an opportunity at sport and physical activity. So yeah. um, that's the premise of it. So we're really hoping that we get um, a uh, – um, we might we won't get to probably the 47 countries, but, you know, if we get 10 new countries, that will be yeah. a huge bonus because it's a stepping stone and we can mm. give them the um, – put our arms around them. What do you need? How can we help you? Uh, and hopefully then the people they represent are able to access pathways if, if appropriate. And I really like the fact you you're weaving in the cultural diversity element as well, uh, which I think is a nice touch. But t- like, tell me, Robin, because listening to you there, it is really systems leadership, right? Because you've got all these systems. You, sorry, you've got all these different stakeholders. You know, you you're trying to bring them along the journey of this common purpose. Like, what's your yeah? What's the what's your trick? Like, how do you how are you able to pull all this together? I think I mean I think it's just about working with people. So there's not too many people I've met, David, that don't believe that when you sit down and explain it to them, that that if you're really genuine about offering sport to someone, why are you just choosing males that are between twenty and forty? And the minute you say that, they go, Oh no, we're not. We're mm-hmm. we're far broader than that. Mm-hmm. But it's actually getting people thinking about what they're doing. So if they're strategically working on developing their sport, why aren't they developing it for all facets of their of their the people in their country? So in this case, Australia, if you're the custodians of basketball in this country, why isn't it for all Australians? Mm. And so that message is not difficult to sell in other countries. Um, they don't all do it the same way as Australia. I think um, you know England, Australia, very much about sport owning it and really driving it. Um, there is varying degrees in other countries. US is going that way. Um, but some countries just have a separate area, but they're still driving that high performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have the resources. I don't believe in a in, in two worlds. I, I, in, you asked me before about the Olympics and Paralympics. I think they work really closely together. There's cross-pollination mm-hmm. the whole time. Um, the organising committee for 2032 in Brisbane will be both. Um, mm-hmm. The organising committee for Tokyo were really closely aligned, as were the ones back in um, SOCOG and Spock back in Sydney 2000. So I think it's just a matter of, of working closely together. But the country, it's just, it's just encouraging them to get involved. And when you meet passionate people like ourselves that really care about helping people, 
this, it doesn't take too much for them to buy into it. They just mm. often lack the confidence mm. or the resources. And if you're able to provide them with a resource or, or you know, offer them a speech or something, um, you know, they're able to uh, get out and do it for themselves. So I think it's just about spreading the message um, and, yeah, getting people with you that believe in it. So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All, all makes sense. And I can't wait for the games. So I'll be certainly coming up to Brisbane for that one. And <laughs> um, we've, we've talked previously about chronic diseases. And uh, yeah, obviously, you, got, you throw COVID into the mix as well, Robin. And, you know, one in two Australians have got a chronic disease. How how do you think we could nudge the system um, and improve the well-being of Australians? Um, yeah, if you, if you could have, you know, you could tweak it a little. I suppose one of the things that's frustrated me probably um, in the last 10 years or so is we've got all these pockets of programs and funded programs and they there's a lot of duplication. Mm. And that's really why I, I'm very supportive of the Australian Sporting Alliance for people with a disability that we've just formed in that let's go out and meet as many disability networks in the country as we can. Let's talk to the health minister. Let's get with, you know, people that are looking after mental health. And, and so bring the groups together and let let them know. And we obviously believe that sport and physical activity can play a role. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it that 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 what is it that what does it look like? Um, it's part of the NDIA as well, making sure that that people are getting plans and and whilst picnics and going to the hairdressers is really important, is it a Pilates session? Is it a session at the gym? What, you know, what is it that we can encourage people to get involved and and do something for their well being, as you mentioned earlier. Um, we ob- obviously realise what's released when we exercise, the endorphins and how it makes you feel. Um, sometimes they might not have had that. But working close, more closely together, um, we're going to be able to identify if it is a chronic condition, what is it that we they can do, rather than say, oh, no, it's too hard, we won't do it. <laughs> Sorry. And... Uh... You mentioned the alliance there, which I just think is is fantastic. Just to get everybody around the table, you know, and 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 share and and learn from each other and start working together. Um, what what has been some of the the wins from your perspective with yeah bringing this collaboration? Well, I guess um, what we realised is starting to work together, and this has been tried in my thirty one years. This has been tried, you know, half a dozen times. And the reason it worked this time, I believe, it was the brainchild of Kate Palmer, the previous CEO of. Australia to get us together and not not put us but let us work together and we've got to the point where I realise and I'm sure my peers realise that we're all very passionate about the why the role that sport and physical activity can play in a person with a disability's life mm. don't all agree on the how some of the mm. delivery is different but the why is really important and so what we've identified really quickly is that there's policies that go out the national excuse me, the National Disability Strategy um, didn't have sport and physical activity and it wasn't mentioned. So that was the last 10-year plan. So what is it that the ASAPD can do? And we did. We wrote a submission to them explaining the value and putting some statistics in it of of how sport and physical activity makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And then um, the preventative health strategy. Again, you know, putting a disability slant on it and looking at it. Uh, there was a massive sport industry sector uh, piece done on the social and economic impact of sport it, right across the industry. But there was no mention of disability and there was one photograph of wheelchair rugby team in it. So, But it didn't Im- address this side of it. And no one means to do it, but we probably haven't had the advocacy group and a leader in it explaining that, have you thought about this? So we've met with a few people around the NDIA to raise the profile of sport um, and one of the architects of it, Bill Short, and we met with Bill and Bill just said, wouldn't it be great if anyone with a disability went in and on the first page of their questionnaire it says, what sport do you do? So no, they might not do sport, but we're, all of a sudden we've raised the profile of sport straight away because mm-hmm. it's on the front page. So anyone that's delivering a plan might think, oh, goodness, sport. So it's just that subliminal messaging sometimes to raise the profile and the opportunity. And are we asking everyone to be in competitive sport no but are we asking for someone to be able to go down and play table tennis in the local club or tennis or uh, be in a local running club or swim you know whatever it is they want to do um, not having to always 
make them jump through burning hoops to be able to join something that's mm. 100 kilometres away that's just for those, those people, the experts. Well, you know, let's build a better community that we've got more experts, far more reaching. Um, and I think that's the ASAPD's got the chance to raise the awareness of, of the power of sport and physical activity. And, you know, just one example, we wrote to all of the state and territory sport ministers, health ministers and disability ministers two Fridays ago, and we've already got five meetings, five meetings in five different states and territories in a fortnight. Um, what are we going to do? What's, what, we're going to talk to them about the alliance, mm. about the need, the, the call to action is to make sure that they lead, that no mm. one left off the group, that they lead some similar discussions, maybe have a round table and we can speak about how powerful it is to work together. And no better example than getting five meetings across the states and territories like that. So, yeah. um, you know, so that there's a, some of the things that, that impact on policy, improve advocacy um, and, and raise the profile so that, um, you know, Paralympics is one end, and that's fantastic, but it doesn't include those that have got a transplant. It doesn't in include people that are deaf and hard of hearing. So there's a wider remit underneath, and what is it that we can do to just get people more active more often? And some of the simplest things are sometimes the most powerful, aren't they? Just that change in language, you know, adding disability in or sport, you know, just those little tweaks. Uh, and yeah, I think stronger together, isn't it? So yeah. which which I think is is a result of you getting these meetings. And so I think it's a really exciting time for for the industry. And uh, yeah, I think the alliance is 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 obviously a part of that. So brings me to my last question, Robin. Uh, we flew through it. It's been, <laughs> been so awesome to speak to you. And um, but where do you see yourself? personally in the system and how do you contribute and influence it? Um, I'll probably come into the end of it really. I've um, been in it a very long time but um, you're just getting started. Yeah <laughs> I think I think it's just sharing um, there's a real appetite from our neighbours um, to, to learn and so uh, by helping our neighbours and I mean our neighbouring countries whether that be in Asia, whether that be in the Americas, whether that be in Oceania. Um, it also raises the profile within Australia. So mm -hmm. the minute the minute you feel like you're a bit of a trailblazer or leading something, mm -hmm. you, you sit up straighter. And when Australians feel that they're whatever, it just helps. So I think we've got some knowledge that we can share. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm, I'm really passionate about sharing that. I think the ASAPD's got a big role to play in continuing to advocate and work for people, um, build the capacity, continue to build the capacity for sport to look at ways. I mean, we had an incident in, in Tokyo where three athletes with an uh, intellectual disability missed the call room. Um, and, you know, for me, that's a big red flag that we need to do more work with the sporting community to understand that if you've got an intellectual disability, there's a cognitive issue there. And like being totally blind, you need to be walked to the call room. There's lots happening. Um, coaches giving you lots of instruction. You're at a Paralympic Games the moment. You leave the, the training warm-up track and you get lost. So, you know, it's, it's not on. And so it's just that understanding that there are, I think we've been good in the, probably since Sydney, been really good with phys overcoming physical barriers. Our buildings mm -hmm. have built specification and we're getting better but I think there's a, a piece around communication that just because you can't see the disability we mm -hmm. can't we should never assume I think that might become my tagline never assume um, so yeah that, look there's lots to be done I, I personally think that um, ha having the Australian sport show off and brag about what they're doing and helping other countries is a really strong humanitarian piece um, that could in a small way as in small contributions from them, make a massive difference to people with, a, with an impairment all around the world. And, and that, what I've learned is it's not just, I guess, the area that I probably focused on in the early days was intellectual impairment. I believe for everybody mm -hmm. um, that sport and physical acti activity can play a role. And I now understand that there are other disabilities um, that are, uh, are hidden sometimes. You can't see it. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
it's about representing everyone and making sure that they can all access the same things, whether it be communication, whether it be physical barrier, um, but just make sure that everyone's able to access whatever you and I have been able to access, basically. Yeah. Yeah, Robin, I think it's I think it's amazing. I love the fact that you you know you're not just looking at Australia and you 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 really you know branching out and trying to help you know the other countries around us that maybe not as fortunate and just need a little bit of support you know in terms of building that capability and resources. Um, so it's exciting. I think the the next the next few years and to see the work that you do and yeah, I just like to to thank you you know for for all the work you do and. Um, yeah, real role model, but there's no doubt about it. And uh, yeah, I, I always love catching up with you, Robin. So is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, I guess um, just thanks for doing it. And thanks for doing what you're doing as well. So I loved it when we met. The synergies are incredible. Uh, not totally aligned, but there were so many alignments. And uh, I think we just need young people like yourself. We just need people to keep taking the baton so to make sure that we that we work together to do it because together as you mentioned earlier i think we can create change mm -hmm. um you know all going off in tangents it, it makes it really difficult for anyone to make sense of what everyone's trying to do but united we've got a chance to really make some change so um yeah just congratulate you and what you're trying to do as well bringing it to people and hopefully um we can continue to move ahead change lives yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact you, you said young, I'm a young person there, so I'll tell you that one, <laughs> even with this haircut. Yeah. All right, Robin. Well, I hope to, hope to um, see you later in the year in person. Um, that, that would be wonderful. And uh, yeah, just wish you all the best. Thanks, David. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for your time. Bye.